Good evening. Very welcome to our evening worship. Just uh, the only thing I want to mention by way of announcement is to remember that the student preaching will be on in Ballyclabber uh, RP Church. That's on Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock when our two students, Mr. Johnny Fitzsimons and Mr. Kenny Stevenson, <coughs> will be bringing God's Word as uh, part of their student assessment preaching. Uh, the c- c- committee of the college, or at least some of them, will be there and they give feedback. And if you have any feedback afterwards yourselves, I'm sure they'll be glad to hear it. But uh, it's an opportunity to hear God's word, and you're all, everybody would be welcome. Uh, worship next Lord's Day, as usual, morning and evening. Uh, the evening, or the morning prayer time, also at 11 o'clock. So just remember that. <clears throat> Jeremiah has a text here in chapter 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. And that's a searching word for any of us as we think about how our God knows us, something we'll uh, touch on this evening. But we come to praise our God, turning to Psalm 18, and we're going to sing the stanzas 1 to 5, the tune is Arnold number 44. The psalmist says in Psalm 18, You will I love, O Lord, my strength, my fortress is the Lord. He is my rock and does to me deliverance afford. He delivers us from all our problems. He is the strength of of our salvation. Indeed, in stanza 4, verse 4, even as the cords of death overwhelm the psalmist, he is able to rest in his God, seeking the Lord, crying to God, who hears his plea. And we know our God hears our plea as we come to him. So we sing praise, Psalm 18, 1 to 5, and the tune is number 44, Arnold. Let us sing praise together.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, hearer of prayer, we delight that we can come to you with our many needs and petitions. And although you already know us and have searched out our hearts, it delights you that we come to you to seek the help that we need, that we might walk in your ways, follow your paths, and seek the encouragement and leading of your Spirit. Be with us this evening, O God, as we cry out to you, as we come to you in your word, as we sing our praise. And may we know again the help of the Holy Spirit, that he will be here in our midst, delighting in blessing us through the word and in fellowship together. Lord, be with us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn with me in the Word of God. I want to read from 1 Samuel, and we're going to read 1 Samuel chapter 2 uh, from verse 1. Turning to 1 Samuel and to chapter 2 and verse 1. <clears throat> First Samuel chapter 2 at verse 1. Let us hear God's word. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled at are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry hunger no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth he humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests with the people that whenever anyone offered a sacrifice and while the meat was being boiled, the servant of the priest would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would plunge it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself whatever the fork brought up. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the servant of the priest would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the man said to him, Let the fat be burned up first, and then take whatever you want, the servant would then answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. 
this sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. We we'll land there at verse 17, and we pray that God will indeed bless his word to us. Now, as we've been doing in the evening, I just want to highlight this evening uh, for our prayers the land of Germany. And we know about this country, uh, a, a land uh, which is often in our thoughts a, a, a very a prosperous country in many ways. Just some statistics uh, 83 or nearly 84 million people, uh, the population under 15 years of 13.8%. Uh, Christianity is supposedly the largest religion there, 64.3%, but only 2.1% evangelical. And of course, there are other people groups, Germany like ourselves uh, in the UK, have had many different people come to live in their midst. And so the land of Germany, just some of the prayer points from the Operation World website, uh, the decline of Christianity in Germany continues into the 21st century. West Germany was 97% Christian in 1960, but Germany is now less than 60% Christian, and the percentage decreases every year. Church attendance for all denominations is low, and many churches have shut down. Christians divide between Protestants and Catholics, liberals and conservatives, and conservative evangelicals and Pentecostal charismatic groups. We thank God that this decline has drawn some believers together in new ways. Prayer movements formed and spread, and churches now work across some cities for evangelism and outreach. Germany's wealth, influence, and location in the EU and Europe could be of great value for the kingdom of God, but it would require strong, courageous leadership based on Christian values. But the spiritual health of Germany is currently in decay. That alone gives us much to pray for, but there are prayer points here also for the immigrants, the guest workers, the students and refugees. Many have arrived in Germany, many illegally, and so uh, they have all of the issues and problems in their society that come uh, from that, uh, many foreign people. Uh, there are international students in Germany, 250,000 of the world's third highest total. And they come to Germany with no understanding of the gospel. So there's an opportunity for the Christian church in Germany. Muslims, uh, more than five million of them, uh, live in neighborhoods uh, and uh, don't really integrate into German society very well. So pray that God might even reach out to these many people, often from foreign countries. Germany, a country of great need, a country of influence, and we need to remember her, her leaders, and the, the church of the Lord Jesus in Germany. And just when I mention uh, the Germany, part of Europe, uh, in the Operation World, uh, uh, prayer points that come through. One of the prayer points uh, today was just to note that the Christian church is now largest in Asia uh, and in Africa and other places. Europe, in fact, is where once the gospel was so preached, is now falling well behind in proportion of Christians. Europe is a very needy spiritual place, needy spiritually. So we should pray for Germany and these other European countries. We think about Germany, we think about the gospel in Europe, but let's pray too for our own government as we enter this new year. Pray for God to challenge, bring them under the power of his word in grace that he might change them, and pray that as a church, God's people will speak to them. So with these matters, let us come before God, let us pray. 
O Lord our God in heaven, we can often think of Germany and reflect upon history, and we know the, the past, the history of war and the troubles. But gracious God, there is today a greater battle being uh, so done in Germany as in many of the countries of Europe. It is the spiritual warfare. And Lord, we would cry out to you and pray that it might please you to strengthen Christ's people, to add to their number those who would truly believe and trust and serve Jesus as the only Savior. We would ask, O oh God, that it might please you, even among the foreigners who have come there, that many of them will come to the faith of Christ and be themselves influencers for that which is godly and good. We know, O oh God, the important position Germany has in the European community and in uh, the general uh, in Europe, and we would pray, O oh God, for her leaders. Father, we pray that you will challenge them concerning the doctrines of grace and truth from your word. We pray that they might heed the message of truth that many in Germany once heard and followed. And we would ask, O oh God, that it might be pleasing to you to bring people back under the sound of your truth. Father, we do remember Europe. What a needy place we are, spiritually needy. And Father, we pray that the churches in European lands, including our own island, might be faithful in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, that we would see in your mercy people brought out of darkness into light, that you, O oh God, will do good in the midst of these days, that as we go into this year, that we might, if it please you in a year's time, be able to look back and say, God has done great things for us in our European lands and in our own nation. O oh Lord, we can do nothing without your help. We are utterly dependent upon you. So we would cry to you, O oh God, strengthen the weak knees, and enable our hands to do what is necessary for the glory of your name. And Father, as we meet here, though we be few, we look up to you and pray, O oh God, help us, do us good, and may we be encouraged in our own souls from your word of truth to continue walking in your paths we ask it in Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> Please turn again. I want to read a portion from the New Testament from Second Peter and chapter 1. We turn to Second Peter and chapter 1, and we're going to read just these first 11 verses. Second Peter chapter 1 from Verse 1, let us hear God's word. Second Peter 1, 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. 
For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is short-sighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray that God will indeed bless his word. Before we turn to the message, I want we sing praise from Psalm 33. Psalm 33, we're singing stanzas 9 to 13, and the tune is Gainsborough number 91. Psalm 33, from stanza 9 through to 13. Here's the, the Lord, uh, the psalmist calling, The Lord from heaven sees all men, views from his house each one. He forms the heart of all of them. He knows what they have done, the knowledge of our God of us. And it is the God whom we can trust. We fear him with a right, a reverent fear. If we're on his covenant love, however, we can come with confidence to him. Psalm 33, 9 to 13, the tune is 91. Let us praise God together.
This evening I want to turn your thoughts to uh, this portion in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Here is Hannah responding in prayer to God's grace and goodness to her. Today in society, we are very aware of many who are fully assured people. They all have much to contribute. They are well off, but they are also, many are proud and a bit arrogant. Uh, They are getting on in life materially well off and feel that they have very few real needs little perhaps to cause them deep anguish or concern. But then perhaps things do come into the lives of some. And there are those, perhaps in such circumstances, who suddenly awaken and realize that uh, that there is a need. Perhaps it is because God speaks and brings them anguish of soul. They suddenly recognize that before God, all the material goods, all the well-being they feel is empty and worthless because they have not walked in the paths of God. To such people, what a blessing that God is pleased to come to them and to call them, to bring them down into the pit, to lure them so that indeed he might lift them up. And in a way, that is what has happened here with Hannah. And it is something that we can learn from at the beginning of a new year, that God is the one who delivers and lifts up. And that he does so sometimes by bringing us down. Here is Hannah's response in chapter 1. We know the story, how she was without children, barren and the stigma and the difficulty and the problem that caused her. She cried out to God and God graciously answered her prayer. And at this point, here she is bringing her son Samuel up to Eli to the temple. There is here actually a contrast between the high view of God that she held in her praying and in her belief and that of the sons of Eli that we read of, how rebellious they were. Uh, And verse 17 sums it up. The sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight. Hannah held God in high esteem. They despised him. What a lesson we might learn from this portion. And we want to think, first of all, about what Hannah says about God's deliverance for her. Hannah, remember, had been in deep anguish. She had been barren. Her rival in, uh, to the love of Elkanah, her husband, had borne children and was very ready to taunt Hannah about her own lack of fruitfulness from the womb. And the pain of that situation is something that it can be fathomed by only a few. The, the problem, even today, of those who are unable yet longing to have children. Perhaps even in Israel, that distress uh, went further because it was of, uh, looked upon as a real stigma of God's lack of care or love. And of course, it wasn't that. But That's how people looked at it, that somehow this person was less worthy. It brought huge distress to an Israelite woman if she could not have children, and Hannah was no different. She was in the depths of distress. But now she has received the gift of a son. What a deliverance that was. Her heart is full of joy and thankfulness to God. And indeed, these first three verses all speak about this deliverance within them. We can just think about how her heart rejoices in the Lord. And if we want to 
to think about this. We want to think about the three things she says about God. First of all, she talks to God as a delivering God. The child Samuel had been born naturally enough. That's maybe a point worth making. It was a natural birth. God was pleased to allow Hannah to have this baby as she knew her husband and bore him in the normal way. But God's hand was in it. It was a deliverance from God to her to enable her to have a child in the normal physical manner. And as she was able to bear so, all the stigma that came with her barrenness was gone. She was delivered from all of those troubles and difficulties. This to her was almost like salvation from the state of being a second-class citizen. And so what joy she becomes. Verse 1, my heart rejoices in the Lord. And look what she calls him, the Lord. In the Lord, my horn, or my strength, is lifted high. And what does she do? She is able to boast over her enemies. I delight, she says, in your deliverance. Hannah had no illusions. This was something God gave. God brought her to this point, and he alone. It wasn't her own strength or suddenly some physical transformation that she had been able to bring about by what she ate or how she kept her body. It was of God. It was God's delivering power. And in this delivering God, she boasts and she knows he is provided for even in the face of her enemy. Her enemy here may have been Paniah, the other woman in that home, her rival. But there's a sense in which this actually is broader than that. It is all the uncaring taunts, all the, the enemies that she might know who could stand before a delivering God. No one. You see, this was not some cocky, brash boast that she could go before her enemies and be delivered. She was depending on the God who delivers, who gives strength. She knew the God was stronger and able to overcome any who might come. And just as he had been able to overcome her barrenness, and isn't that the case for you and me if we come to Jesus Christ? It is not because I have done anything or you have done anything. It's certainly not by my being righteous. It's not because I have been able to pray enough or read the Bible enough or come to church enough. None of those things. We are delivered from our sin only because God is the God who delivers from our enemies. It is by his Horn, his strength that we walk in the righteous ways we do. He has changed our sinful nature into a new nature, desiring him. So we should give thanks to God for delivering us. And as we stand on the threshold of a new year, this is the message we need to remember throughout the year. It is not of us. God is the delivering God. He is the one who is able to help us in the face of our enemies. Just as Hannah was able to say, her boast over her enemies, I delight in your deliverance. Who is your enemy? Satan. Our boast is over our enemy. Not because we have strength of ourselves, but because we know the God who delivers. But Hannah knows a second thing about God. She knows that he is a holy God, a holy one. Look at verse 2. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Here is the God who is absolutely unique. He is the rock, but he is the holy rock. He is the one who 
and comes in all perfection and righteousness and does everything for his own glory. There is no one like our God. We look at some great figures in history, even in the recent past. We applaud them at the end of the year. We always have those programs that uh, pick out the sports star or somebody who has done uh, great good works. And yes, they have been able to do mighty things. Many have acted, uh, done much for charity, but none of them are holy. Even within the church, there are many who have done a great deal and proclaimed the truth, but they are not holy in the same sense that God is holy. We are only made holy, sanctified by the holy God who has delivered us from sin. And today you and I need to come and recognize that we need to accept the only one true, holy, living God. And through and because he is holy, he is able to provide salvation for us. That he sent the holy man, Jesus Christ, to suffer all the demands of the law, keeping it perfectly, and then also suffer on the cross the curse of the law for our sin, though he had no sin. Only such a one could deliver from our sin a holy God, Jesus Christ our Lord. And with him there is none to compare. And so we could take Hannah's words, there is no one holy like the Lord. And think of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead. There is no rock like our God, no stronger than Jesus, the Son of God, to hold you and me in salvation. And so as we go into this year, we go into a new year with a holy God and depending upon him for all our ways. He stands apart and we worship him for it. Thirdly, Hannah speaks about a God that knowing God and we've touched on this in what we've sung and in what we've read <clears throat> Hannah in a way in verse 3 gives a warning to any who might hear her and be less than careful about what they say she is not speaking proudly but there are those who do people are not to get the idea that because they do not see God, he does not see or know them. Such an ostrich-type mentality is futile. It ignores the truth of God's word. Hannah saw that God saw her. God heard her prayer, knew her need, knew her intimately in every cell of her body, and was able to change and miraculously enable her to bear children so that she was delivered from that painful barrenness. Just look what she says then. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speech speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. And here's Hannah's word about to the enemy, to those who are, you're, if you like, with their nose in the air and looking down at her. What warning. God sees you. And God knows you. And he knows your thoughts. God will weigh it up. You have nothing that you can speak proudly of. And that applies to us today. There is nothing that we can be proud about in our lives before our God. For anything you are, or anything I am, even in this world, is a gift from God. Yes, we might uh, come to God with thanksgiving, but there is no place for human arrogant pride. No. 
the Lord reigns. The Lord provides. The Lord grants you every grace. The Lord directs your every step. And he sees your waywardness. He sees your sin. He knows you better than you know yourself. Paniah might have arrogantly thought, I'm bearing children. I can do that. But the reality for her was that God enabled her to bear those children. It wasn't all of her. The hand of God was on her. And she needed to bow before the living God, the holy God, and recognize that she had no room for boasting over Hannah. The same is true today in Christian service. Whatever we're able to do, it is only because God blesses. Whatever gift you may be uh, seen to have is God's gifting to you for the use in his service. Give thanks to him. So do not talk proudly. The Lord will know it. And the Lord will weigh you. And just think about what happens in the next section uh, uh, when Eli's sons and all the wickedness there uh, going on ignoring God's holy ways. And then we have this word, the sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight where they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. And what happened to Eli's house? Condemnation. God dealt with these sons and indeed with Eli's house. They came to naught. And the Lord, if anyone continues in arrogance and pride, the Lord will bring them down, humble them. Our prayer would be that it might be a humbling so that they will be lifted up. In fact, that leads us to what Hannah goes on to say. Because the second main thing we want to think about is what she speaks of, of God's ways. God is at work, she says, in this world. All is under his command and control. Here it's stressed in the verses 4 to 8a. Look at the series of contrasts there are there in those verses. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. The man with the, the bow might find, find himself, think he's strong, but it's the one who stumbles and falls actually has the strength. There's a contrast. Those who were full, in other words, who had plenty to eat, hire themselves out for food. But the hungry hunger no more because God provides for them. And here you see in each of these different cases, that which is broken down and seems to, from a human perspective, weak, is lifted up and exalted. Whereas that which from a human point of view, those who have food, those who have the bow and are strong, and others, they seem to be doing, but they're broken and they're brought low. This is the way of God. He takes the lowly Hannah and he lifts her up and blesses her with children so that she can say it's as though I had seven children or more. Even though at that point, the focus is on Samuel. Whereas Paniah, she had the children, but her life, was there's an emptiness about it because she doesn't seem to know much of the ways of the living God. It works out also in verses 6 and 7. The Lord brings death and makes alive. The Lord brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. This is God's way. So if you have been brought down low and humbled, if you've been brought to that place where you have to look up to God when things are at a low ebb, give thanks to God. Rejoice in your being low, brought low. For there's only one way to go, and that is to look up to God. And he will raise you up if you cry out.
to him. He will grant you all that you need. That's his way. He takes the arrogant, sinful man in the world who is strutting about as though he can do everything, and he bashes him with ill health or financial ruin or whatever else it may be until he comes to be at naught with himself and he cries out, O oh, living God, save my soul. And friends, we need to be open to the reality that in our broken society, God is at work to try and cut down the arrogance of the godless. If COVID didn't do it, what might? If the cost of living crisis that we're all talking about will not bring people to realize that God is in control, well, we need to be ready because he will bring down those people that he might raise them up or unless it's his purpose to bring them down to their shame and to the pit in the grave. But you make sure you humbly seek him and desire him and walk with him and exalt him that he will lift you up. Just look at verse 8 here, how uh, Hannah speaks. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from an ash heap. Isn't those words wonderful? Those who know their place and their wickedness and their problems, the Lord draws near. And what does he do? He doesn't just set them on the ordinary level. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. That's the blessing you and I have. Taken out of the pit of sin and set as a prince in the kingdom of God. When we humble ourselves and recognize his hand upon us, he takes out the stony, hard heart gives a heart of flesh. He completely renews the wicked, lifting them up. Oh, we should pray that God might be at work in this way today, that people would be conscious of humbling, that the hard times bring them to the depths, that they might look to the rock to lift them up and lead them. Jesus Christ himself, in speaking to his followers, the scribes and Pharisees in his day, along with them, spoke in this way. Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He means the righteous in their own eyes. But the sinners, those who know their place, will bear for it. That's God's way. The weak, the unimportant, are lifted up. Thirdly, and associated with that, of course, Hannah speaks of God's power. The foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. What power! Here's the creating God. He is all-powerful. No one can stand. He will guard, she goes on, the feet of his saints. But the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. That's a prophecy of the coming of Christ from the very lips of this world. Hannah as she praises God and exalts him. God's power was going to do a mighty thing in Israel in the days to come. And we today see it in Jesus Christ and rejoice in him who came to be the Savior. What mighty power that he should come, humble himself to the cross, notice God's way, humbling to the cross, the very depths, but be raised up, King of kings, Lord of lords, the one in whom you and I are to trust. 
This is the Christ that we worship. This is the power of God that was in him to give him resurrection life for the glory of his name. And as we go into a new year, let's remember God is the all-powerful God, able to do mighty wonders. The world may be in chaos. People despise and reject. Everything seems to be completely uh, uh, opposite to what we would think is according to his will. But God, in his mighty power, laid the foundations of the earth, and he, by his strength, will exalt Christ, his king, our king, and bring glory to his name. God's deliverance, God's ways, God's power. May we be walking with our God as we enter and go in through this new year, exalting his name. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are the God who delivers. You have delivered us from our sin. We exalt you, our mighty God. For you are the delivering God. You are the holy God. There is none like you in majesty and holy power. There is none like you, Lord, for you know our hearts. And if we should be hypocrites and confess the Christ and not be walking in his ways, you see it and you know us. Forgive us, O Lord, for our sin. May we walk in your ways. O Lord, humbly, knowing that only when we humble ourselves will be lifted up by you, and may we know your mighty power. Father, fill us with your grace and your spirit in this year. May we individually and corporately be blessed of you and walk with you, and let us, O Lord, delight more and more in the King of kings, Jesus Christ, your Son, that through him, we might indeed delight to serve our God and Father by the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to conclude as we turn to Psalm 41. Psalm 41, we're going to sing stanzas 1 and 2 and 10 to 12, and the tune is Humility, number 100. How blessed the man who towards the poor acts wisely, and with care. The Lord, he will deliver him when evil days are here. We're blessed when we serve God and indeed do it by serving others. The Lord will keep him, save his life. He blessed on earth will live. Psalm 41 is singing stanzas 1 and 2 and then 10 to, and to 12. The tune is humility 100. Let us praise God together.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with God's people now and always. Amen.